Income Tax 2022-2023, Circular 230, Regulations Governing Practice Before the IRS. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Circular number 230, Regulations Governing Practice Before the Internal Revenue Service is a good resource to have. You can find it on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're talking about practice before the IRS, it being similar to like a legal situation where you might have a lawyer acting on behalf of a client to say a court. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it possibly empowered to make certain decisions even if the client isn't there due to a documentation of something like a power of attorney. You might have a similar situation in tax related issues. If you're at a tax court or dealing with the IRS, a client or taxpayer might want to hire someone to represent them, make decisions on their behalf, giving them certain powers to act as an agent, possibly with the use of a form like a power of attorney. Now, this is a huge resource for many uh, CPA firms and tax preparers because clearly clients would like them to give them help with just preparing the tax return, but it would also be nice if the IRS came back with questions and they questioned a position that was taken that you might be able to, to have someone that can act on your behalf and make decisions on your behalf, possibly saving some time and possibly having more abilities to you know, make those types of, of decisions. So that's the idea here. So obviously there's rules and regulations in terms of who can, can act in that position because now we have a situation where usually you have this differential in, in knowledge and that's where the whole profession comes into play because you need to make sure that the, that the professionals involved aren't taking advantage of the difference uh, in knowledge and so now you've got these rules that are basically applied here. So contain it's, so this contains the circular 230 contains rules governing the recognition of attorneys. So attorneys can practice and act in this capacity as well. Attorneys are usually much more broad in scope. And when they're working in tax, then if they choose to work in taxation, they're usually working in a specialized kind of area oftentimes. Certified public accountants, now, certified public accountants are usually credentialed more on the accounting. So they come more from an accounting uh, kind of field and then are specializing in, of course, the tax area. Enrolled agents are usually specified more in tax itself, oftentimes than being focused on individual income taxes, possibly or specialized areas. Of course, there's a lot of overlap in a, in a lot of the stuff. Enrolled retirement plan agents, our main focus isn't really on the retirement plan agents here, but similar kind of situations there. Registered tax return preparers and other persons representing taxpayers before the Internal Revenue Service. Subpart A of this part sets forth rules relating to the authority to practice before the Internal Revenue Service. So do you have the capacity to practice before the IRS on behalf of say a client or taxpayer? Subpart B of this part prescribes the duties and restrictions relating to such practice. So what do you have to do for to, in order to do that, your due diligence and that kind of stuff. Subpart C of this part prescribes the uh, sanctions for violating the regulations. So if you don't do what you're supposed to do, your due diligence and whatnot, what are the consequences? Subpart D of this part contains rules applicable to disciplinary proceedings. And uh, subpart E of this part contains general provisions relating to the availability of official records. So we'll just go through a couple items here. You can look it up in the IRS website to peruse it in more detail. So practice before the Internal Revenue Service comprehends all matters connected with a presentation to the Internal Revenue Service 
or any of its officers or employees related to a taxpayer's rights, privileges, or liabilities under laws or regulations administered by the Internal Revenue Service. So pre uh, such presentations include, but are not limited to, preparing documents, filing documents, corresponding and communicating with the Internal Revenue Service, rendering written advice with respect to any entity transaction plan or arrangement or other plan or arrangement having a potential for tax avoidance or evasion and presenting a client at co uh, conferences, hearings and meetings. So clearly this can be quite advantageous to a client if you're able to correspond basically with the IRS and especially if you're required to go to meetings and whatnot, if you can do that <laughs> on their behalf, uh, th then that obviously is a is a good perk for you know a client oftentimes. So who may practice? You have attorneys, certified public accountants, enrolled agents, enrolled uh, actuaries, and enrolled retirement plan agents. So obviously when you have a tax practice uh, kind of situation or if you're practicing uh, in tax, then you want to think about where's your specialization going to be and uh, are you are you going to be in a situation where you're going to be taking on uh, representation and whatnot and can can that be a, a beneficial thing basically to the practice usually again clients would like to have that capacity uh, in the people that we're working with or that could be a valuable resource and give them a little, at least a feeling of ease in case the IRS comes back with questions so register tax return preparers so others any individual qualified under section 105e or section 10.7 is eligible to practice before the irs to the extent provided in those sections government officers and employees and state of uh, officers and employees so these are the people that could uh, practice again these, there's a wide range of difference between these individuals and some of their specializations so you're going to want to get into more detail depending on where you fall on uh, the spectrum so fees in general a practitioner may not charge an unconscionable fee in connection with any matter before the internal revenue service notice what we have here is basically an attempt to have some kind of like self-regulation within the industry because uh, if you have a situation where just one or two people are dishonest within it obviously what they are doing is they're they're actually profiting off of the goodwill of of the industry in and of itself so so it's like having a doctor if you had a doctor and there's all these good doctors out there but you just have a few doctors out there that are really uh selling snake oil and ripping off people then they're really making money off of the goodwill of the good doctors and and so that's kind of the problem so the industry of the doctors have have an incentive to not allow the snake oil salesmen to basically do that because because then it, it hurts everybody so the same kind of thing goes for any kind of profession where there's a big difference between you're selling something that's knowledge based that means there's going to be a difference between understanding between uh yourself and the client and that's where there's always potential for scamming to take place and some kind of, of rules that hopefully can be somewhat self and put within the profession instead of uh, outside rules from like a, a legal consequence kind of thing because there's there's an incentive for the industry itself to self-regulate because of of the of the nature of the situation so except as provided in paragraph b2 3 and 4 of this section a practitioner may not charge a contingent fee for services rendered in connection with any matter before the internal revenue service so contingent fees are kind of an issue oftentimes because if you're saying that my fee is going to be contingent on an outcome then that kind of changes the whole uh, incentive structure and with regards to taxation oftentimes the, the the idea of course is that is that you're there to try to provide the tax returns or create the tax returns as uh as as accurately within the law as possible if you start to create incentive structures where you're going to you're going to charge them based on like how much money you get out of it which is going to be dependent on like a tax refund or something like that then then the tax preparer has more incentive to basically be dishonest about their positions that they're taking they, they may be more likely to make more extreme positions because 
it would benefit them possibly more than the client because the client could run into troubles with those positions along the road. You've got this agency issue where the agent's, uh, agent's goals would be a little bit different than, than the client's goals, which leads them to have kind of different, different strategies and whatnot. So contingent fee is any fee that is based uh, in whole or in part on whether or not a position taken on a tax return is or other filing avoids challenged by the Internal Revenue Service or is sustained either by the Internal Revenue Service or uh, in litigation. A contingent fee includes a fee that is based on the percentage of the refund reported on a return that is based on percentage of the taxes saved or that otherwise depends on the specific result attained. Now note this differs a little bit than what you might expect from other kind of legal situations where you have attorneys that might say that they're gonna uh, do the work on contingent fees. And you can see why that would might be beneficial in certain attorney cases, although it still leads to this agency issues where you have lawyers being highly aggressive in situations that are pro possibly detrimental to the client because they just wanna win the case because their fee is contingent on on the winning at, at any cost. But you can see a, a situation where if someone can't afford a lawyer, but, uh, and you say it's contingent, well, then you can kind of afford the lawyer because if you win, they're taking on a risk. If they win, they get paid kind of thing. But with taxes, it's a little bit different because you can't really say, I, I'm gonna do your taxes, but only contingent upon whether or not you get a refund because that invites scammers who are gonna take very aggressive positions. And the whole point is that you, you're hiring someone that, that's gonna hopefully help you to be in compliance with the law, not take aggressive positions. Because if you take an aggressive position preparing the taxes, it's quite possible that you do get a refund in the short run, but you could be audited in the next three years. And if it was a very extreme position, it could be the next five years. So after the person got paid from the contingent fee, doesn't mean the client is not on the hook. The client could still be on, is on the hook. And so in any case, a contingent fee also includes many fee arrangements in which the practitioner will reimburse the client for all or a portion of the client's fee in the event that the position taken on a tax return or other filing is challenged by the Internal Revenue Service or is not sustained, whether pursuant to an indemnity agreement, a guarantee, a uh, recession rights, or any other arrangement with a similar effect. So if you set up a situation, you're like, okay, look, it's an extreme position we're taking here, but uh, if, they, if the IRS audits you, then we'll reimburse you for it. Notice again, the problem here is because then there's an incentive to take these extreme positions. And you can imagine a situation like the, the, the IRS is set up so that they audit certain returns. They audit a percentage of the returns. It's kind of similar to a situation where if you're on the road, you don't speed because you, you could speed, you'll, you won't get caught most of the time, but when you do get caught, the fee is gonna be high enough that it disincentivizes you to speed all of the time. Same kind of concept with the tax law. Now, if you had a practitioner that's just gonna play the odds, if you're talking about someone that has hundreds of clients, then, and he just says, okay, whatever, we'll just take really extreme positions and then I'll just pay back, I'll just pay off the ones that get hurt. Well, because he has hundreds of clients, there's only gonna be, if they just audit randomly, there's only gonna be a few that actually get caught. And, and so you can see this is a scammy system, right? So now he's doing scammy stuff here and you can't, that's the problem. So return of client records. In general, a practitioner must, at the request of a client, properly return any and all records that the client, uh, that are necessary for the client to comply with his or her federal tax obligations. So it's kind of, you would think this is obvious, but you get in these situations, especially when there's fees that aren't paid or something like that, where the tax preparer doesn't give back and, and actually says, refuses to give back the, uh, <laughs> the documents and whatnot. And obviously they're not the tax preparer's documents. They're, they're only there so that you can prepare the tax returns. And so you might, so you got to give them back to the client. You would, and it seems pretty clear. So the practitioner may retain copies of the records returned to a client. So you might make copies in the event that you have to justify, you know, positions and whatnot, but you would give the originals back. You would think that's the general process. The existence of a dispute over fees generally does not relieve the practitioner of his or her responsibility under this section. So if you're going to say, well, if you don't pay my fee, I'm not going to give you your documents back. That's 
that just seems childish, but you know, that happens. <laughs> Nonetheless, if applicable state law allows or permits the retention of a client's records by a practitioner in the case of a dispute over fees for service rendered, the practitioner need only uh, return those records that must be attached to the taxpayer's return. So the practitioner, however, must provide the client with reasonable access to review and copy any additional records of the client retained by the practitioner under state law uh, that are necessary for the client to comply with his or her federal tax obligations. So then we have conflicting interests. Except as provided by uh, paragraph B of this section, a practitioner shall not represent a client before the Internal Revenue Service if the representation involves a conflict of interest, a conflict of interest exists if. Now note, clearly this should be intuitively kind of makes sense. If you're, <laughs> you know, if you're going to represent someone saying you are my agent, you're acting on my behalf, I'm paying you to make decisions for me, your job is to make decisions that are best for me and my interest. Now you already have an agency issue no matter what, because even though you're kind of on the same side, there's always gonna be this kind of agency problem where certain decisions are gonna benefit the agent differently than the tax preparer. We don't wanna complicate the situation by having a complete conflict of interest between someone who's supposed to be acting as an agent, uh, but have, has interests that might be counter to that action. So the representation of one client will be directly adverse to another client. So if you've got two clients, obviously it'd be like it'd be like you're trying to you're trying to represent both sides of like a divorce case that doesn't make any sense right you see you can't really i mean if they're at odds you 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 know then then you're gonna you have to represent one or the other if it's a mutually exclusive kind of thing you would think so uh, and even if you're saying well that's not true like i have had a lot of people argue they say well that's not true because i can be fair i can be just even though uh, there's two people that have these different interests. That may well be, but even still, you can see why they wouldn't want to do it because you don't look to be fair. It doesn't look to be just, right? You do, you, no matter what you say, someone's going to argue that you're that you're not being fair, even if you totally are being fair. And so the fact that that appearance is wrong would mean that someone else would be better suited for that position just due to appearance alone, you would think. So there is a significant risk that the representation of one or more clients will be materially limited by the practitioner's responsibility to another client, a former client or third person, or by personal interest of the practitioner. All right, advising and solicitation uh, restrictions. A practitioner may not, uh, with respect to any internal revenue service matter, in any way use a parti or, or participate and the use of any form of publication, public communication, or private solicitation advertising containing a false, fraudulent, or coercive statement or claim. So clearly, advertising is becoming more and more important. The whole goal of the profession is, is to maintain credibility. So it's kind of similar. You can, you can compare it to other professions like the medical profession, which is one of the oldest uh, types of professions. And if you're, if the medical profession, you have someone advertising snake oil, that's going to say, that's going to cure every known disease to man. Obviously that advertisement again is if it drives clients is profiting off of the goodwill of not that person, but off the profession in general, and is therefore dampening the profession in general. So that's the profession itself has a, has, has a incentive to stop that that kind of the kind of uh, poaching type of thing that people will do with a false advertising and lies and coercive statements so uh so or misleading or deceptive statements or claims so basically lying kind of in advertising so then the question of course is well what does that mean you know what is that enroll agents enrolled retirement plan agents or registered tax return preparers in describing their professional designation may not utilize the term certified or implied an employer employee relationship with the Internal Revenue Service. Examples of acceptable descriptions for enrolled agents are, quote, enrolled to represent taxpayers before the Internal Revenue Service, end quote. So obviously that's kind of a long statement, but they're trying to be clear uh, that that you're not like employed 
at the Internal Revenue Service, right? They're trying to distinguish what the actual rule is, quote, enrolled to practice before the Internal Revenue Service and, quote, admitted to practice before the Internal Revenue Service, end quote. Similarly, examples of acceptable descriptions for enrolled retirement plan agents are, quote, enrolled to represent tax payers before the Internal Revenue Service as a retirement plan agent and enrolled to practice before the Internal Revenue Service as a retirement plan agent. An example of the acceptable description for uh, registered tax return preparers is, quote, designated as a registered tax return preparer by the Internal Revenue Service, end quote. Advertising and solicitation restrictions continue in here. So a practitioner may not make directly or indirectly an uh, uninvited written or oral solicitation of employment in matters related to the Internal Revenue Service if the solicitation violates federal or state law or other applicable rule, e.g. attorneys are precluded from making a solicitation that is prohibited by contact rules applicable to all attorneys in their states of license. So any lawful solicitation made by or on behalf of a, a practitioner eligible to practice before the Internal Revenue Service must nevertheless clearly identify the solicitation as such and if applicable identify the source of the information used in choosing the recipient standards with respect to tax returns and documents affidavits and other papers so uh, tax returns a practitioner may not willfully recklessly and through gross incompetence sign a tax return or claim for refund that the practitioner knows or reasonably should know contains positions that a lacks a reasonable basis b is an unreasonable position as described in section 6694a2 of the internal revenue code including the related regulations and other published guidance so if if it's clear that you're taking a position on the tax return which a lacks a reasonable basis b uh, is an unreasonable position then of course you shouldn't be taking that position on the tax return now we talked about before that there could be areas that are gray areas we talked about the hierarchy of of uh, resources in terms of the internal revenue code and then uh and then other you know regulations uh, issued by the irs and court cases and the fact there, are, there will be kind of gray areas. So you might not be completely sure. You, this doesn't mean that you can say this position, I'm not 100% sure that would hold up within an audit. That's not the, the rules we're looking for because there could be positions, of course, that we're not 100% sure of because they're not completely covered by the code. But uh, th this would be like the terminology, the guidance that you're basically looking for here. So you can't take a position that, that once again let's read the whole thing a practitioner may not willfully recklessly or through gross incompetence assign a tax return or claim for refund that the practitioner knows or reasonably should know contains positions that a lacks a reasonable basis b is an unreasonable position as described in section 6694a2 of the internal revenue code including the related regulations and other publications guidance so c uh, is a willful attempt by the practitioner to under to understate the liability for tax or a reckless or in intentional disregard of the rules or regulations by the practitioner as described in section 6694 of the code included the related regulations so again notice the terminology often present in the law the willful attempt that term willful and these kind of things that are geared towards intent are difficult to kind of define uh, you know or prove like in practice but obviously they're important in the law but notice if it's not exactly uh, willful you also have the term reckless right so you oftentimes you can say well did they do that did you did you take a position that was clearly wrong okay did you do it recklessly like you just didn't you, you know you didn't take the time to consider and if you did a reasonable per old person would have would have made a different decision possibly or willful you did it on purpose that would typically be worse generally right if it's willful you knew the right path you knew the right thing to do and you willfully did otherwise 
And so uh, advise a client to take a position on a tax return or claim for refund or prepare a portion of a tax return or claim for refund containing a position that A, lacks a reasonable basis, B, is an unreasonable position as described in section 6694A2 of the code, including the related regulations, other publication guidance, or C, is a willful attempt by the practitioner to understate the liability for tax or a reckless or intentional disregard of rules or regulations by the practitioner as described in section 6694B2 of the code.